Hello and welcome to AER uh, 204, Accelerating Geospatial ML with SageMaker. My name is Jeff Maynard. I'm the space product leader for AWS's space services team. And I have the privilege of introducing Kevin Wheel, president of product and business of Planet, as well as uh, Chris Eflin, the GM of Geospatial AI and ML here at AWS. Uh, throughout this session, Kevin and Chris are going to talk through the what, the why, and the how of machine learning techniques on satellite imagery. Uh, to help detect the impact of disasters, uh, such as finding the safest path for first responders to get into neighborhoods affected by fire or hurricane and detecting structurally compromised buildings and homes. Uh, the quality and frequency of satellite imagery is key to training many of these machine learning models, which is where Planet excels with their over 2,000 days of satellite imagery from 200 low Earth orbit satellites. Uh, with the constellation of this size, they're able to have revisit times measured in minutes and hours instead of days. Couple this breadth and speed of satellite imagery with AWS's machine learning tools such as SageMaker, and you can build and train impactful machine learning models quickly, and then deploy them against planets' imagery data streams to detect events and drive actions in the physical world with minimal delay from when those events actually occurred. With Planet and AWS, any company can become a space company. Um, and the great thing there is that not only can you start a brand new space company in your garage, but oddly enough, that's how Planet started. So I'm going to kick us off with a video to explain a little bit about how Planet came to be, and then I'll turn it right over to Kevin and Chris. Thank you. A decade ago, out of a Silicon Valley garage, Planet began its stellar journey. We've always had the goal of empowering humanity with imagery of the planet taken on a more frequent basis. Through Granular, I use Planet satellite images to help my customers. Corteva offering those services has become a valuable part of my business. And the imaging, what you're looking for is the darker color. You know, the darker the color, the better the plant health. We're getting pictures every day. I can look at different dates and see what the field looked like and then see how it progressed or got better or worse. You just cannot tell from the ground everything that's going on with that image that you get. Not only is it more frequent than you can visit the fields, but it's also a view that you just can't get from the ground. What's happening in Xinjiang is one of the biggest human rights crises in the world. We used satellite images as one method of identifying camps and prisons around the region of Xinjiang. We went to Planet and sort of said to them, we're pretty certain that there's a camp in this area. We need more recent imagery. And Planet actually tasked a satellite for us and went and photographed this place. So we got this high resolution, up-to-date imagery, which allowed us to confirm that this place that I'd suspected was a camp was in fact a camp. Planet data gives us a real opportunity for understanding how the Welsh environment is changing in response to a whole range of drivers. The quality of the planet data, particularly the SkySat, is just superb. The nice thing about SkySat is actually we can task parts of the landscape and say, I want to have the picture of this at this time. It really does provide us with a new capacity to understand what's going on, when it's happening, how it's happening, and what we can do about it. Hey, Kevin. That this is absolutely incredible stuff. I'm so excited to be talking with you uh, today. Why don't you kick us off and talk a little bit about Planet's tech and uh, Earth observation and what it means. Yeah, so Planet started with this crazy idea. Like, in a world where everyone was building uh, these billion dollar school bus sized satellites, you know, think people in Oompa Loompa suits in clean rooms, you know, climbing ladders to, to mess with a giant satellite. Planet said, well, what if we could build them for three to four orders of magnitude less money? What if we could make them the size of a shoebox? This is a literal satellite. It weighs six kilograms. This is an exact model of what we have up in space. And what if you could do it in a way that you could build dozens of them you know, in weeks, and you could launch dozens of them at a time, and you have hundreds of them in space, and you can image the entire planet every single day as a result? So we were started in about 2010, and the first probably six years of the company's life was just proving that this was possible, proving that we could do it, and we did it. And now, 
for the last six years, we've been imaging the entire planet every single day. So we have 2,000 days of history over the entire Earth. So any point on Earth, we've got 2,000 days showing how it's evolved. And whether you're looking at a, an ecological perspective from a security perspective, the use cases are immense, right? So you can think, you can think about agriculture and crop yields. You can think about geopolitics, like the example in the video. Um, understanding where Uyghur camps are being developed, looking at you know finding missile silos that we didn't know existed. Uh, you can think about civil government making permitting more efficient. You can think sustainability, climate, all these use cases. And Planet has done this with a belief that we can improve sustainability and security around the world by bringing transparency. Just shining a light on what's happening, providing ground truth, can be a really positive force in the world. But as we did this, we now have another problem, which is there's so much data. We've gone from a world where having a satellite image made you, you know, unique to a world where we're producing 4 million satellite images every single day, 30 plus terabytes. And it's very clear, you can't, you know, it's not about, the future is not going to be about humans using their eyeballs and looking at 30 terabytes of imagery every single day. It's about using AI and machine learning it's about using computers for what computers are good at, helping identify change and telling us where we should look, and then using humans where humans are great, which is around providing context and understanding what kinds of actions we should take. So that's how we look at the world, and it's why I'm so excited to be here uh, with our collaboration with AWS today, because that's what we're doing. We're making it easier to use AI and machine learning on top of geospatial data. That's right. I, I'm beyond excited to be working with you guys. It's been a Really great adventure. What I think what has gotten me most excited about uh, Earth observation and, and getting machine learning working with, with your data is just the dearth of data. There's so much data, there's so many uh, opportunities for machine learning that we're really just kind of starting to scratch the surface. So some of our customers today, you may have heard, we've launched uh, new capabilities today inside SageMaker. But we have customers today uh, working on everything from uh, insurance risk, they're you know, underwriting policies on new construction. They're even using satellites to monitor construction, see how construction is progressing. We have uh, sustainable uh, city developments. So we have customers using SageMaker, working with municipalities, making sure there's uh, good green spaces. Cities are, are walkable, more walkable, and more livable after their construction projects are finished. Uh, everything from retail, using retail uh, retail data and satellite data to predict where are the best locations for my next uh, retail expansion. All the way through to FinTech, who's using uh, Earth observation data and machine learning to predict uh, commodity prices and un understand how wheat uh, is being harvested or being impacted by uh, the conflict in Ukraine. Um, all the way through, and what I love about agriculture, it has such... Uh, enormous impact on climate, which is near and dear to my heart. Um, so even like looking at harvest yields, crop health, uh, soil moisture, these are all things that you can do, all of our customers can do today inside SageMaker using some of the models that we're launching. Um, so tell me a little bit about uh, how you guys have been working with uh, climate science and some of the projects that you've been working with. Well. I mean, it, the range of, of use cases is really stunning. Uh, if, one I think that's, that has been fascinating to me, we, I talked about our belief in transparency. Uh, we do a, a, a number of public-private partnerships where we actually make data available for free even. Um, and there's one uh, called the Allen Coral Atlas. We worked with Paul Allen's organization to create a map of the, the world's corals. So every sort of low-lying coral reef in the world, along with categorization of the type of, it, of coral it is. And then we made it available for the world's researchers. It's allencoralatlas.com, I believe. Um, and you can go look at it today. One of the coolest things about it is just creating this data, just providing ground truth data creates transparency and creates accountability. So one of the things we saw after releasing this is something like five or 10 different countries passed legislation to protect their coral reefs. It's not that they didn't know that those coral reefs were there. They absolutely knew. But once the data was public, they knew that everyone else knew that they were there as well. And that kind of accountability spurred action. So the, 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 the range of use cases for this data is just never ending. Um, but it's, it, it still takes a lot of work 
and a lot of expertise in some cases to get the value out of it, which is why this collaboration is so meaningful, because we're just making it easier. Yeah, yeah, and that's exactly right. I think one of the, the, the use cases that's near and dear to my heart, I grew up in California. Wildfires are, have been a fact of my life, honestly, since, since I was very little. Uh, my family's been uh, evacuated more times than I can count. Uh, and unfortunately, this has just become the, the way it is now. Uh, with climate change, it's, it's a real part of our life. Um, but being able to combine satellite imagery with all the other types of geospatial data is immensely powerful. So not only do we have the, the images that are uh, pulled off the satellites, but we also have street level data, we have building, uh, building footprints, we have foot traffic, we have census data, the list goes on and on. 60% um, of the data produced today, at least 60% of the data produced today is all geo geospatially tagged. Quick show of hands, how many people here are not carrying their phone with them? <laughs> right, so every single one of the apps on your phone, they're all collecting geospatial data, whether you like it or not. Whether it's direct, coll direct collection or whether it's implied collection, all of this data is being collected and you know, being used to hopefully m make things better. And this is why I think that I'm so excited about uh, what we're doing with you, because I feel like the the work that we're, uh, we're undertaking here is actually gonna have a meaningful impact on, on people's lives. Um, so let me just kind of take a step back and explain how this works if you're not familiar. So the way typically machine learning works with geospatial data is you really have to pull the data together. So you've gotta get, you know, obviously gotta get the data off the satellites, but there's all sorts of other data. Maybe you've got data in your S3 buckets. <clears throat> Maybe you have, you wanna uh, get open street map data. Maybe you wanna get place data social check-ins, all kinds of stuff that you can kind of put together. But you need to kind of transform that. A lot of, there's lots of different representations uh, for how data is stored, different coordinate frames, um, and you want to get that all aligned. Sometimes you want to enrich that data, which maybe means uh, taking a GPS trace and converting it to uh, a road network. Well, what road did this GPS trace happen on? Maybe you're getting just a GPS coordinate and you want to convert that to a street address. So those are all types of enrichment uh, activities that you want to kind of just prepare your data to make sure it's ready to make really, really solid uh, predictions with. And then eventually, then after you're done with that, you want to get your model together. You need to decide what, your, what type of problem you're solving. Uh, are you making predictions? Are you detecting objects? Um, so you got to figure out you know, what type of architecture is. Is, is it a deep net? Um, and then once you have your model, you need to deploy it. You need to host it. And you, you know, whether you're doing batch, trans, uh, batch inference or whether you're doing real-time inference, these are all considerations uh, that you need to think about. But SageMaker makes these things very, very easy. Uh, and then finally, with mapping data specifically, you really need to kind of take a look at it, right? It's, it's fundamentally uh, a visual medium. So you have, obviously, the beautiful imagery coming off uh, the, the, the planetscope and sky sat satellites. Um, but being able to kind of put it together, look at your predictions, how does that correlate with the data you put in? Does it make sense? There's a lot of iteration here. And even when you're done, even when you got to the point where like, okay, these predictions are pretty good, you still have to go back, you still have to kind of maintain it because it'll start to get stale over time. So if you haven't heard today, we're announcing in preview uh, full geospatial support inside, directly inside SageMaker. Uh, so what this means is we're offering now a full geospatial data catalog that you can access directly from inside the notebook uh, and, the, and SageMaker Studio. This includes satellite imagery from open source sources, uh, as well as data from uh, your S3 buckets if you have planet data, um, as well as third-party data sources uh, such as uh, uh, Amazon Open Data. Uh, next, we're going to be uh, offering up a whole set of pre-trained models to get you jump-started. This includes everything from uh, land use classification, cloud removal, all sorts of things to kind of help jump-start your, uh, your, your journey uh, with machine learning. And then finally, I'm extremely excited to announce that we are partnering with Foursquare uh, to implement and integrate their Foursquare Studio, formerly Unfolded AI, uh, one of the, the best uh, web-based visualization platforms uh, available today, directly accessible and, and uh, usable inside the notebook itself, and you can access this uh, today. So just a quick snapshot on what this looks like. Uh, typically, anyone who's licensed or used uh, satellite data in the past, it, it, it can be a bit of an experience, right? You've got to figure out what sources you need, what date range you need, et cetera, et cetera, you know, how much cloud cover you need. Uh, it can be a, a little bit daunting. 
we've really taken this uh, notion of accessibility and really baked it into the product on a, on a fundamental level. So what used to normally take months or weeks now is literally uh, less than a minute. Point and click, draw your polygon. What area do you want to look at? I want to look at the, uh, you know, I want to look at the Rockies. Let's draw our polygon, and now you've got access to all of the data that, that it matches. It's a simple slider, lets you choose how much cloud cover you're willing to tolerate, um, but that's it, that's it. And you pick your model, and you're, you're off and running. Uh, so like, like Jeff was saying, we really want to focus on making sure that we can take the friction out of the system, make anyone, any, any customer uh, a space customer. So one of my core beliefs is that this is one of the most untapped and valuable data sets out there. Because, I mean, how many of you entering today knew that there was an image of the entire planet being captured every single day, and that it went back 2,000 days? You could study anything about what's going on, basically anything macroscopic across the Earth, and you could study it going back 2,000 days. Almost nobody knows, and historically, it's taken a fair amount of expertise to be able to build, which is why I'm so excited about what we're doing, and I'm curious, as you think about making this easier for people, what are the use cases that you're really excited about developers building? Yeah, I mean, the reason we partnered with Planet was really around the, 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 their whole mindset is different, right? Being able to have the, 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 the temporal uh, intervals of continuous capture, high resolution, these fundamentally change the game. They're fundamentally oriented around uh, solving problems with machine learning. Right, so I think for me personally, uh, a lot of it is, is, is climate science. This is the stuff that, that uh, you know, I, I grew up with, uh, you know, getting evacuated from high school because the, there's too much smoke in the air. Um, and, and I think all of us are starting to feel, starting to feel this in a, in a very, very real way. Um, and, and, you know, in tandem with that, uh, there's a lot of amazing work being done around agriculture, being able to understand you know, biomass health, uh, not at just the field level or the farm or the state, but we have customers today in SageMaker analyzing the, the rainforest uh, for the past 10 years. What's the, what is happening with the rainforest? And they're, using, they're doing that in combination uh, in collaboration with the United Nations, which I'm, I'm super proud to be a part of. Um, and then even taking this forward, so just kind of make it really concrete uh, for y'all. Uh, this is an, a, a, an example that you could kick off today if you wanted to. So we have uh, an off-the-shelf model that does land use classification. This is basically takes all the pixels and classifies them on about 12 classes. So this is, you know, is it snow, is it desert, is it grass, is it trees? Um, and what this allows you to do is start to puts the power in your hands. You're able to go through and monitor uh, the ice shelf uh, or sea level changes uh, inside SageMaker directly. Um, and using planet data, that change detection becomes even, even more critical. So when you think about something like a, a disaster uh, where the situation is changing by the minute, by the hour, uh, that type of data is just so essential. Um, so let me just kind of wrap this up and then we can kind of, yeah. One thing that I think is also interesting, um, we're seeing, uh, you talked about Ukraine, we're, we're seeing the, the worlds of sustainability and security increasingly be linked. So it's not, it's not just one, it's not just the other there. I mean, what's happening in Ukraine, the war creates a food shortage. You've, there are other cases in the world where food shortages create war. We have a customer, you know, he talked about, um, uh, he, he talked about deforestation and, right. and the Amazon. Yeah. We have a customer in Brazil who's looking at deforestation in the Amazon. They're applying change detection to the 10 million square kilometers of the Amazon, right? Way bigger than any human is gonna look at every single day. But they're doing change detection to figure out when roads are being built, because a road in the Amazon means two things, often. One, it definitely means deforestation, and that's bad. Two, it often is someone building a road so that they can go build, you know, a quick airport and or a quick, you know, uh, runway um, that signals, you know, uh, drug trafficking, for example. And so it's another, it's it's a use case where they're not just stopping deforestation; they're actually limiting drug trafficking, looking at geospatial data, using AI and machine learning, and bringing together these worlds of sustainability and security that you might normally think are are quite different. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. 
Um, so uh, available today, uh, inside under the data section uh, inside SageMaker, you can access all of the new geospatial features. Um, so this includes an Earth observation job, which allows you to start to pull in satellite data today, so that's available today. If you already have planet data in your S3 buckets, you can pull that in natively, it'll work. Uh, we have off-the-shelf models that all work with, uh, with planet data, which I'm super excited about. Um, we also do vector enrichment, so if you're using location data, you need to convert GPS coordinates to map data or map road segments or point addresses like geocoding, reverse geocoding, those are all supported as batch jobs. Um, not only that, but we also have uh, new purpose-built notebooks. So there's whole notebooks that are designed specifically for geospatial type operations. Um, we have off-the-shelf models, as I mentioned, uh, and custom instances. So we have a full geospatial instance that has, about, has all of the most popular geospatial libraries baked right in. So if you're already doing things with geospatial data, chances are we've already got you covered with our instance type and you can, it's very, very seamless to move your job over. Uh, and then finally, as I mentioned, um, we have this amazing toolkit with uh, Foursquare uh, and the, the Foursquare Studio lets you uh, render about a million, over a million points per, per browser pane, uh, full, fully 3D accelerated, amazing visuals. Um, so really kind of bring those, those maps to life and also allows you to share those maps. A lot of this iteration requ requires uh, you to share the data with your colleagues across, across the enterprise. Um, so let's just talk through some quick examples. This is an example of uh, the fire, uh, the Dixie Fire in Greenville, California, historic town in Northern California. This happened last year. Uh, using our off-the-shelf models for uh, building detection and then building damage assessment, we were able to detect uh, the, all the, the fire, the damage that happened during the fire. It was obviously very dramatic, um, but this is using all the off-the-shelf models that are available today. Um, and this is a perfect example where planet's data can play a huge role, right? When you think about if I'm a first responder trying, I'm CAL FIRE trying to respond to this, like what's going on on the ground? What's happening hour by hour? Where, where should people be evacuating? Do we want to, I mean, there's a very real danger that people can get evacuated into the rest of the fire. Um, and so having planet data, having that high refresh rate uh, makes things like this accessible to just, just about everyone, which I'm really excited about. So, Similar example, opposite coast. This just happened a couple months ago. Again, with Planet's uh, amazing resolution, uh, kind of drives the point home a little bit more. Um, but slightly different but very related example, you can see some areas were totally spared, but right next door, absolutely decimated. Um, and so when we're thinking about how we as you know, a society can respond to these types of tragedies, where should we be sending resources? You know, inadvertently, resources can be sent to the wrong spot, uh, especially when people uh, are under, uh, under duress or at risk uh, when there's an active situation going on. Um, so with, without these types of predictions, uh, first responders wouldn't know where to go, uh, wouldn't know where the hardest, hits, the hardest uh, places were hit. Um, so I'm sure it goes without saying, like putting stuff in space is probably pretty hard. <laughs> Uh, so why don't you tell us a little bit about like, you know, uh, what it's like running, uh, running space systems and, uh, and how does that work? Yeah, it's, uh, so I came from the software world. I spent most of my last 10, 15 years um, as head of product at places like Twitter and Instagram. So the hardware has been uh, new for me and it's been an incredibly steep learning curve, but it's been a blast. I mean, but the amount of things that can happen in space just is mind-blowing. Um, yeah, for example, you've got 200 satellites out there. You've got high-energy gamma rays that you don't control that come in whenever they come in, wherever they come in, and they might you know, knock a pixel out of your CCD. And so forever, that pixel is, is dead in, in one of your cameras, in one of your telescopes uh, orbiting the Earth. And it's not like you're gonna send anybody up there to fix it, <laughs> right? So, uh, so forever, you're correcting that in software. Um, and there's a hundred other things like that that, you're, that we're constantly um, having to sort of play catch up on in order to make sure that what, what gets output, right. that what you all see, looks like it was a single image of the entire Earth taken by a single satellite when in fact it was this collection of 200. Then you have clouds. And I grew up in Seattle, I thought I knew clouds. I had no a sense of it before coming to planet. And it turns out like, more than half the Earth on a given day is covered in clouds. 
And you have to get really good if you're trying to do ML at understanding how you remove clouds. You've got to do it in a consistent way. You want the shadows to be in the same place. You need, you need, it's not just clouds. There's haze. There's the shadows that come from the clouds. And uh, you know, we've had to, over years, uh, get really good at doing that with our imagery. It's one of the things that you can now do out of the box with the SageMaker integration, which is awesome. And trust me, makes your lives way easier. <laughs> um, and then the other thing is around uh, the imagery itself. If you go to the next slide, uh, we think about you know, this is called optical imagery. We think about this as something that we can look at with our eyes. But our satellites don't just measure the visible spectrum. They also measure into the near infrared. And there's a whole world there that we do not see, but you can, you can understand a whole bunch about what's happening uh, and how the world is changing using the near infrared band. Um, and so in particular, it turns out, Chlorophyll is a molecule that reflects really strongly in the near infrared. And so you can use the near infrared band to understand things about crops that you couldn't understand otherwise. So if a crop, you know, vegetation, a crop, et cetera, is healthy, it's got a lot of chlorophyll, it's going to reflect really strongly in the near infrared. If it doesn't, it's going to reflect weakly. And so beyond what you can tell with your eyes, you can look at this response to understand how crops are developing. And you look at it not just, you know, because we're planet is imaging the world every single day. So it's not about one image. It's actually about the time series that you get. Um, and you can compare that with previous years' time series to understand how crops are developing and where they should be, where they actually are, looking at yields. Uh, and you go collectively from a world where it used to be about a farmer walking his field to understand how crops are developing and where there are problem areas to a world where 200 satellites 500 kilometers above the Earth can understand crop development and crop yield, not just across one field, but across every field simultaneously all over the world using AI and machine learning. So it really is just, when I say this is the world's most untapped data set, that's what I mean. That's super exciting. So what's, what's next for Planet? Uh, so we've got a bunch going on. Um, one, we are building some new constellations. So we're, we're, Planet's sort of first edge has always been that we are creating data sets that the world has never seen before. So for one thing, we're building a new high-res constellation that will be on the order of 30 centimeters. It will be super fast revisit. We'll have uh, some new technology. We'll be able to do edge compute in space. Awesome. So we'll be able to run AI algorithms on satellites. Uh, and they'll also have connections to uh, Telesat comms. So we'll be able to disseminate the data immediately rather than waiting for a satellite to go over a ground station. Just all kinds of uh, exciting new things on that front. We're also building a hyperspectral satellite. So if you go to the next slide, um, this is, uh, a, we talked about the value of, of imagery that isn't just optical imagery. This is a partnership that we've got going with NASA JPL with an organization called Carbon Mapper and others to build a satellite that covers not just the, the visible spectrum, but from 400 nanometers all the way out to 2,500 nanometers in five nanometer increments. So you end up wow. with not, not at like eight spectral bands like, like these have, but 400 spectral bands. And I was just talking about near infrared and how it allows you to basically detect chlorophyll. With 400 spectral bands, you can do more or less, uh, you can sort of fingerprint different molecules based on which spectral bands they, they show up in. And the, the key, or the, the sort of guiding thing um, for this constellation is to measure carbon and methane everywhere in the world. So a new way of providing ground truth, of holding big emitters accountable, of allowing governments to hold big emitters accountable through regulation, because now there's a ground truth data set on carbon and methane emissions that there, there hasn't been. Uh, but there's also myriad other use cases. So you know you can think security use cases, um, looking at camouflage, for example. The whole point of camouflage is it looks to your eyes like it's you know brown and green vegetation, but of course chemically it's different. So these satellites can can tell that apart. You've also got a whole host of like biodiversity uh, and ecological use cases that come when you can basically fingerprint molecules from space. So that's a big focus. And then just in general, 
we've got all of these incredible data sets, but the, a lot of the, the focus of this talk has been around how we make analysis easier, how we make it simpler to extract signal from noise. And so we're doing a lot of work in how we fuse different data sets and allow our customers to more easily get at the signal, not, not start at the data and have to analyze you know, petabytes of, of, of imagery, but how they get these higher level things that look more like answers uh, because our belief is the more that we can, instead of having everyone start with imagery, if you can start with something that looks more like a time series, if you can start with something that fits in an Excel spreadsheet, then suddenly we're going to be able to, uh, to get this data, the most untapped data set in the world, in the hands of far more people, and that's gonna mean that we can create far more impact around the areas of sustainability and security that we care about. So, I think it's gonna be an exciting bunch of years, and it's very aligned with the collaboration that we're announcing today, making this all easier to analyze with AI and machine learning. Yeah, I'm so excited to be uh, making this all accessible uh, to everybody uh, starting today. So uh, with that, I, I wanna just say thanks to, to, to Kevin and the whole Planet team. Um, really excited to see what's next. Uh, there's so many different use cases, so much opportunity here in terms of uh, what's possible. Um, so uh, I, I just, um, you know, beyond excited to, to be kicking this off with you guys.